our next speaker is Jean McNeil, who is Professor of Creative Writing at the University of East Anglia. Jean is the author of 14 books, including six novels and a collection of short fiction. She's been the recipient of numerous grants and awards and has won the PRISM International Competitions for Short Fiction and for Creative Nonfiction. Her work has been nominated for the Governor General's Award for Fiction, the Journey Prize, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation National Literary Awards, and the Pushcart Prize. She was the winner of the 2016 Banff Mountain Film and Book Festival's Grand Prize for her memoir, Ice Diaries, based on the year she spent as writer in residence in Antarctica with the British Antarctic Survey. She's undertaken official scientific and environmental writing residencies in the Falkland Islands, in Svalbard, and aboard ship-based expeditions to Greenland and across the Atlantic Ocean. Recent work includes a multimedia exhibition in 2018 on landscape and the life and work of Walter Benjamin, as well as curating and writing the texts for an exhibition, Notes on the Anthropocene, as part of Barcelona Gallery Weekend in September last year. A new novel, Day for Night, is forthcoming from ECW Press next month, but Jean is going to be reading today from her next but one book, Anthropocene Diary, which she's recently completed drafting. So welcome, Jean. Jean's title is Translating the Language of the Land. Yes, thank you, Duncan. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. I'm sure somebody will tell me pretty quickly, if not, if everything is, is OK. Um, thanks so much, Duncan, for inviting me. It's been a fascinating conference and discussion. And um, yeah, so I hope to provide perhaps some light relief as the final act in, in the conference in that I won't be delivering a scholarly paper. I'm sure you'll be relieved to hear as I'm not actually a scholar. Um, but what I will do is I'd like to show you all some images, first of all, of some of the places I've written about. Uh, it's not comprehensive, but I just thought that some kind of pictorial um, stimulation at this point might go down well. And I also have to say that just very briefly, um, I was fascinated by Michael Cronin's talk. It was very wide ranging, obviously hugely commanding. Um, and one, of, one thing in particular uh, stood out to me, his discussion about thinking and translating outdoors um, really got me thinking. Uh, what, what do we do as writers and thinkers outdoors? Um, often not a lot, as he said, we live our lives confined, confined to boxes. And what if we take our work outdoors? What happens? What happens somatically in our bodies? What happens intellectually? What happens creativ cre creatively? Um, anyway, I've spent a lot of time outdoors. I'm, I'm almost outdoors now. I'm talking to you from the Indian Ocean coast of Kenya. So where I'm at, it's about 130 kilometers south of the border with Somalia. Um, it's a very, very uh, natural place. In fact, it's a nature reserve. It's a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. And it's high tide now. So you might in the background actually be able to hear the crash of the ocean. And hopefully we won't be interrupted by any other creatures or, or nature, but it could happen. So just to let you know, um, that's where I'm at. The languages here, by the way, are Kiswahili and Giriyama, um, are, the, are the local languages. So it's, it's, it's quite a multilinguistic environment that I'm in. One is translating all the time, in fact, here between um, languages spoken. So what I'm going to do now is, as I mentioned, show you uh, some images of landscape to get in mind what I'm going to talk about. It's a kind of prequel to the book uh, that I'll read from. And then I'll read from Anthropocene Diary for about 12 minutes. And then we're going to have a discussion uh, compared in the very uh, deft hands of, of, of Duncan, I believe. And so we have a chance for um, yeah, questions or, or any kind of commentary. Now, I'll go straight into reading, actually. Sorry about that. I'll see if I can share it with you in a bit. I think it's just a, it, it's a large file and it takes a while to open. Um, this book, I'm, I'm going to read three short episodes. First of all, it's work in progress. It's very dangerous reading work in progress as a writer. The main danger being that it's, it's not ready yet. It's not very good. But I think it's, it's probably worth sharing uh, specifically because, of course, it speaks to the themes of this conference uh, quite felicitously. 
landscape as metaphor, translation as metaphor. I think that's the kind of idiom that I'm dealing with in this, in this creative work. Of course, the question is metaphor for what? Are we sure we know what metaphor is? Um, I, I want to also kind of try to write an anti-memoir, a memoir about living and working in wild places and what I've witnessed in the Anthropocene. Um, as a sort of life history, but without me in it much. So this is, this is the task. So here are three short episodes. And as I say, I'll be done in about 12 minutes. Um, the first one is who we are. The pressure emerges from no fixed point of origin. A black vacuum is solidifying. We are tugged as if from galaxial dreams into wakening. Blue flares on the edge of our eye, the electric solemn azure of gas. This is the first thing we see. Then a gathering of energies, a compacting, roiling nebulae. It is 1000 degrees. An internal comet streaks through us, leaving a mineral seam in the anoxic air. A planet-sized creature named Thea barges into us. We explode excrete a cavity of ourselves. This new entity backs off to keep its counsel 30 planets away. Time accumulates, we cool and solidify. We wait for the russet light of a proximate star to fall upon us, to tell us we are born. We are the core, the mantle, the crust, the plates, the strata, the substrata, the topsoil, the air. We vault through these layers, propelled from liquid nickel to desert dust to us. We drink oxygen, but the lithosphere will be our true home. We organize ourselves into old arrangements, which even we have forgotten. Ur, Valbara, Kenorland. Within our intestines, creatures stir. Who are these? They will be lumbering, yet graceful. They will fail to convince even themselves of their reality. They do not know that they exist on the meniscus of time, on the thinnest skin of now. We, on the other hand, have been schooled in forever. We will wait them out. May 2013, Makuleke, Northern Kruger Park, South Africa. What can you tell me about this elephant? We squat, staring at dinner plate sized tracks. It's a sub adult, probably two years old, we say. It was traveling north yesterday, probably in the evening, heading to drink in the river. Good guys, good, Adam says. Now let's go and find them. Adam has brought a revolution in our small world. A wild haired, mild voiced man, twice as tall as his good friend, Brian, our regular instructor. His knock-kneed stance and exposed feet make him look too delicate, even innocent, to be a safari guide. In order to attempt our trails guide qualification, we have to rack up a certain number of encounters. This is the official term for stumbling upon a herd of buffalo submerged in a sea of grass, or a lioness sashaying down an ephemeral river in search of the wilderness equivalent of a takeaway. It becomes a word we say many, many times every day, bleached of its sexual innuendo, more evasive than meeting, but less alarming than collision. If we don't naturally encounter enough encounters for our dangerous game logbooks, Adam will arrange them. And as you might expect of someone who willingly takes ingenues on a driving instructor jaunt with mortal consequences, Adam is extremely calm. A guide for 26 years, he rarely speaks. And when he does, he sounds a bit Keanu Reeves. Eventually we understand that this guru persona masks a perceptive loner, much happier sitting on the edge of a herd of elephant than pouring a gin and tonic for a hedge fund manager from Frankfurt as safari guides are often required to do. Keep present, Adam instructs. If you allow your thoughts to drift, you get surprised, he says, which means you surprise the animals. And what happens when wild animals get surprised? He doesn't wait for an answer. In the early morning cold, we move swiftly along the Limpopo under a canopy of white green fever trees. 
We walked narrow trails carved by zebra and eland through swamps where crocodiles masquerade as logs. As the hours pass, heat congeals and the gold axe of sun cleaves our heads. Suddenly, Adam makes the shh gesture. As we round the tree, we see our quarry, an elephant ball, only 15 meters away. The swishing sound of 20 kilos of wisteria being masticated is soothing. The bull's trunk and ears swing in a wide, pleasured ellipse. But if the wind were to switch direction, this is what would happen. His ears would become rigid. His left foot would come off the ground. He would swivel his head in our direction and hold his trunk aloft like a periscope. After that, anyone's guess. Worst case scenario, a charge that would scatter us into sharp thorn bushes and possibly grind slow moving outliers such as small women carrying too much weight in the form of her rifle and backpack into a pulp. The elephant keeps on chewing. We file away. We got away with it, Adam grins. This game of interspecies peekaboo is exactly what we're learning to perfect. The most successful bushwalk is the one when the animals didn't even realize you were there. The trails guide should chaperone her clients around the bush like a Greek chorus, silent observers in a spectacle of devourable decay and survival worthy of Euripides. You should never have to kill an elephant, Adam instructs us. In Botswana, where he qualified, guides are forbidden by law to carry firearms, as we do. Instead, they carry umbrellas and a roll of double pleated toilet paper. You open the umbrella when the elephant starts its charge. Then you grab hold of the end of the toilet paper and you chuck the roll at them, he says. We put down our rifles, mystified. The umbrella phases them because it's a sudden obstacle, Adam explains. And then they think the toilet roll is a big snake. Plus, elephant don't like the color white. We students trade glances. Elephant are extremely smart. How could they mistake a toilet roll for a mamba? Adam shrugs. It works, guys. Trust me. Although he concedes that the elephant and Makoleki are different from those he's encountered elsewhere, the reserve was on the ivory trail, Adam tells us, a killing corridor that yielded hundreds of tons of ivory in the first phase of the war on elephant at the turn of the 20th century. The animals have been hunted systematically here along the Limpopo. They remember. Makaleki has a difficult human history too. In 1967, the apartheid government evicted the Makaleki people who had lived on the land for millennia. We visited the remains of their hillside village one day while following a group of white-throated bee-eaters. Only the skeleton of one hut remained. That evening, I, I sat on the veranda of my tent with my hurricane lamp. It was May, winter was coming. The sun swung through the eye in an increasingly shallow arc. I thought of John Berger's essay, Animals as Metaphors. Animals are born, are sentient, and are mortal. In these things, they resemble man, Berger writes. What divides us is language. It's not only that we don't speak each other's language, he writes. There is not even the possibility of language between us. Only Orpheus, who could talk to animals in their own tongue, knew of their hopes and their fears. But Orpheus had descended into the realm of the human dead and returned fatally mute. I watched a baobab turn bronze in the angular sun. I tried again to feel rapture for this place, but I was overtaken by a sense of enclosure. An unease seeped from the ground itself. Even the Limpopo, which was just passing through after all, could not dispel the fume of rumor in the land. Voices, people, or animals were speaking through it, perhaps trapped within it, an eternal exile. The sun disappeared into a cold amber sky. Night in Africa offers no opacity. It is bitumen, thin and cold. A chill passed through me. I grabbed my head torch and went in search of fire. September 24th, 2020. Our Indian summer has departed. The skies harbor a new scrubbed note. Sharp rainstorms drift above London, then sail on. We entered so-called lockdown 188 days ago on March 23rd. In these stalled days, I embark on a personal challenge to write a book, which I don't think I can write, which I think is impossible to write, 
but yet which will attest to the years I've spent in wild and remote places, but which will try to go beyond the usual ramparts of representation, of interpretation, of memoir, all of those process-driven concepts to which language has become enslaved. What I want, to quote Kathy Acker, Acker, is to write unmediated experience, to write from inside experience without language collapsing under the strain. I begin to wonder about the point of view of the land, of what the world looks like from its perspective. In this term land, I'm probably hopelessly conflating landscape, the earth, all that is, nature, the wild, the more than human world, climate change, the Anthropocene, it's impossible, but yet I need a name for this realm and the land will have to do. Would it be possible to write from the land's perspective without boring people stiff in a way that didn't come across as sanctimonious? I begin to think about the Anthropocene's value as a metaphor which unites historical temporality and human power. It's also a relational notion. It describes the interaction with man and everything that is not man. So a brief list, turns, daffodils, the troposphere, skinks, bromeliads, safari ants, tapers, mackerel, the cinnamon-breasted bunting, fungi. Then on the opposing side, grazia, QR codes, Botox, microplastics, oat milk, Real Madrid, vegan burgers, interest-only mortgages, Twitter spats, Ikea, lemon meringue pie. It's hard not to notice how badly human ephemera compares with the most mundane list from the natural world. I sit in the gathering dark, daunted by the fact that we do not speak the land's language so we cannot hear it. But if I tried and listened closely enough, would I be able to detect some pattern, some frequency? I think of Claude Levi-Strauss's monumental Tristropique. We are alive in a zone of ephemerality, uncapturable, he suggests, and our awareness of the transient ferocity of experience is what distinguishes the human will from the vast arena it cannot control. How would that arena sound? A lime bower, horses trade shadows in the long afternoon, their dreams of red wars, layers of mountains, serene hazes, orphan fires, lit by lightning, the wind scraping the grass. So that's, uh, that's it from Anthropocene Diary. Okay, yes, let's, uh, let's hope that that can, uh, uh, that can fire up before, before too long. But no, Jean, um, the, the, uh, the uh, technology held up uh, very well. And uh, I, I hadn't realized uh, that you were where you are. And uh, it strikes me that uh, that that brings to uh, uh, four the number of continents represented uh, uh, just among our speakers uh, at our event. Um, Jean, thank you so much for uh, for your reading. I think um, it's really I, what a, a wonderful uh, range of uh, perspectives uh, today. I'm thinking from uh, Rindon's uh, scientific examples through to your um, your uh, uh, creative nonfiction, your memoir, uh, your uh, take on the uh, on this question of translating. Uh, of eco translation of translating the the language of the land. I, I was struck by the the variety of forms that you're you're using in order to do this, and I was wondering whether because you you began by talking about the multilingual um, uh, context in which you're writing at the moment, and I wonder whether you whether this is a a, a conscious decision on your part to the, the, a sense then that the the language of the land needs translating in multiple in multiple ways in order to do it justice i mean yes i think as i mentioned you know my whole project seems to me to be you know kind of impossible really um in that i start from a, a position of impossibility as as john berger mentioned you know we are you know, language is our greatest tool and also perhaps our, our greatest limitation. And one finds this out very quickly when you are a writer because it's, it's a constant struggle to actually say what you mean in very basic terms. 
Um, and I think with regard to my proposition of, of there being a language of the land, I think the fact is that Th there must be, you know, there must be at least a kind of force field. And, and certainly I've picked it up in, in places like the Antarctic in which it's, it's hard to describe, but, but the whole physical realm is, is broadcasting on a different frequency. It's absolutely apprehensible. Some of it might be totally scientifically understandable because of the magnetosphere and the, and, and the ionosphere and all sorts of forms of, of, of various distortion that you get, say, in the polar regions. But nonetheless, I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's my very fanciful notion and people either, I think, have, people are either prepared to accept this or they think it's preposterous that places do speak to us actually and they speak to us in a language which is both at the one simultaneously um, paradox alert comprehensible and incomprehensible at the same time and um you know they they also that we are individually translating our affinities with places pretty much all the time into our own kind of lexicon you know for an just to give you a very brief example i won't go on about this but the place that i'm at now Watamu in Kenya, it is extraordinarily compelling. It's the it's it's almost like a cult. It's the most beautiful place anywhere that I've ever seen. Probably, actually, um, I don't tend to rank places, but nonetheless, that's not the reason that I keep coming back here. I'm trying to actually understand. I think something quite generative about the relationship between the land and the sea and history, the kind of curve of history, the blade of history, if you will, here. Um, and I, is it ever possible to get beyond the human in this endeavor? And uh, in that, indeed, to get beyond the human would signify to get beyond language somehow. I don't think so, but I think it's, about, it's a project of attentiveness. It's a project of a kind of radical attentiveness to place, even as we are the, the, the destroyers, effectively, of, of places. Fundamentally, that's what's happening. Uh, a comment uh, from uh, uh, from Helena Buffery in the chat. It looks as if your presentation is open on the taskbar at the bottom. I don't know if we could maybe make oh, one, okay. yeah. one last, one last uh, attempt. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you, thank you, and every everybody. Thanks for um, thank you for bearing with me. I really appreciate this, and thank you, Duncan, for jumping in. Um, I should have just started off with comments myself, actually. But but okay, everybody, if you if you can bear with me, this is what I wanted to show you very briefly. I'm not going to tarry here, but these are my books on the polar regions. And just to give you some visual stimulation, this is exactly what we've been talking about, you know, the whole conference in the round about, about, about the, 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 the mystique really of, of communication and the possibility of communicating in the Anthropocene with the sphere of the ecological. So here is a trip to Greenland. This is a scientific expedition. I've, I've been a writer as Duncan signaled on a number of um, official expeditions. Uh, um, do you need to share your screen again? Ah, uh, right, okay, hang on. Sorry, yeah. Um, hang on, I'll just hit the screen sharing button. Oh, that's a shame. So, right, here we go. Ah. Now, can you see it? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, everybody. So I'll just um, I'll just backtrack there. There is a very fine ship indeed. That is the James Clark Ross, the uh, Royal Research Ship of the British Antarctic Survey. And what I was saying was that these are some of the landscapes that I've I've written about, and I'd like you to see them again very briefly. We'll just do a whistle stop tour. These are all my images. Um, you, you know, obviously these places are, are very wild and remote and extreme, all of them. And they come close therefore to bringing us in touch with a, with, with, with a kind of wilderness sublime. Um, and particularly in the polar regions, you enter into a kind of regime of light and a relationship between sea and sky and ice, which you simply don't see anywhere else. I mean, Greenland, which these images were taken in Baffin Bay in Greenland, um, Greenland is a much more accessible, less dramatic, less stern and unforgiving uh, correlate of the polar regions than the Antarctic, which you'll see shortly. But I have to say Baffin Bay was one of the most astonishing places I've, 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 I've ever been visually. It was, it's amazing we got any work done. We, you know, we were doing 24 hour science, but mostly we, st we stood out on the back deck just with our mouths open at three o'clock in the morning, looking at things which are 
pretty much indescribable. Um, these are some images, but ultimately it was about the relationship, as I said, of those elements of land and sea and sky. And, and I got close to a notion that I'd encountered first in, in the Antarctic, which is that some places seem to be beyond language. Certainly they're not, in that if you think about classic explorer narrative, um, you know, these books were hugely well written, but also they were lived, they were lived experiences. These men, they were all men, wrote and nearly died or wrote and died or, <clears throat> you know, a combination of writing and death, which has never really been excelled, I think. Um, so they're not technically beyond language, but nonetheless, it was the, the first place I've been in my life. And uh, to date, I guess the only place I've been where I just thought writing was pointless. You know, it was just absolutely pointless. What am I doing here? I was, I was overwhelmed. Language was kind of blown straight out of my head. And yet I ended up writing four books. And, and, and maybe it's because of that kind of impossible challenge um, that one does. And images and abstract art and representational art as well, to an extent, I think do a much better job at conveying the, you know, the mystique and the fragility and the, the, the immense dignity of, of these places that are beyond the human, especially the Antarctic, which is what we're looking at now. So here, sorry, here you see as well, this kind of reduced landscape of effectively, you're really dealing with a few elements of sea and sky and ice and occasionally land. Um, the Antarctic is a continent, so it, it does have a terrestrial reality, whereas the Arctic is, is mostly um, sea ice in its, in its larger extent. Um, but again, we're in a land where these are monumental. These are the, these are some examples of, I haven't got it to scale, so you can't ap appreciate the scale perhaps. But um, again, the color regimes that happen because of atmospheric effects and because of the tilt of the, the axial tilt of the planet are just indescribable. There's our ship again. Um, and it's also a place which is talking about translating experience, which is mediated entirely by machines. Without machines, you're dead. This is the dash seven. Um, without machines, none of this sublimity is, is at all possible. This is a four engine plane that's landed on ice, for example. No, no brakes allowed. You know, it really is quite extraordinary. You're at the limit of your endurance, of the machine's endurance and of the planet's indifference to your survival. And that's what's so thrilling and so forbidding about the Antarctic. There's no coming back. I mean, you might survive a plane crash, but you're not gonna survive after that. You know, that, that is the, the there's no rescue. Um, there is some rescue in some cases, but generally speaking, you're, you're on your own. So, you know, the Antarctic was um, really quite instructive in terms of landscape writing and doing, and it, I suppose it set me on this, this task, this impossible task of trying to figure out what are these places trying to say to me anyway, at least to me um, in my very reduced singular idiom. Um, and then very briefly, this is, this, is, this is where I am now actually, this is Kenya. These are landscapes that inspired my two most recent novels apart from the one I'm about to publish. And really my book, my work, uh, these certainly these books are all about place. I wouldn't have written them without place. Um, and by place, I mean everything, that whole package that I listed previously, the whole of the non-human world in, in that I, the, you know, there's a paradox here. Fiction is a social form. It's about, people. It always has been about people. Landscape and place and the, the, the ecosphere is relegated to a background to our human dramas. Um, but my task as a writer is, is again to try to figure out what, what is the dialogue, what is the, the, the language between the place and the, the events that it generates, the, the, the kinetic events in the people's lives, because I think some things are, are possible in certain places and, and other things are not. Um, so this is Namibia, which, which is the inspiration for the novel Fire on the Mountain. And within places, of course, are, um, are, are, are regimes of danger and safety and negotiation. Um, they're not neutral spaces, nor are they static spaces, and, um, and, and one is, it, it, you're subservient to them effectively as a human, and we forget that when we live in urban spaces, it's very easy to forget 
the lack of control and the lack of protection that we have. So again, I'm sorry, folks, that took a while to get up the, the PowerPoint, but we got there in the end. But I, I just thought it would be good to um, see some, some of these raw vistas. Absolutely, Jean, thank you so much. It was certainly worth the wait. Um, I, was, I was reminded of uh, that wonderful um, poetry collection, Les Murray's Translations from the Natural World. And I, I was thinking about the, the, the question of, uh, of, of genre as, uh, again, and whether um, the, the uh, differences between uh, possibilities of, of fictional and poetic uh, representation of the, of the natural world. And, and you're, of course, uh, 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 drawn to a, a, a fictional expression. Do you find um, that your, your, um, your voice is uh, uh, changed through your, these in, encounters with different landscapes, for example? Yes, I think actually one's voice, at least for, for me, speaking for me, my voice as a writer um, changes with every single book. And uh, it's not as consistent, perhaps, as, as, as with some of the writers in it, and, and perhaps it's not as consistent as, as it should be, because it's responding, it's responding to the place. So, for example, the novel Fire on the Mountain, inspired by Namibia, has something of that solemn, elemental, stern tone to it. Um, in, in, in its emotion, in what happens between the people, it's in, they, they've imbibed the charge of the landscape. Whereas in other places, like here, again in Watamu, you have to learn the language, the local language. In particular, I think the specific language that is about flora and fauna and the natural world, um, and even the names of everyday things. You know, here in Watamu, it seems a lot of them are Swahili, some of them are Giriyama, but the very names of things like Mbamba Kofi, which is a kind of tree, or Kazuarina, or Neem, or Mayembe, which is, <clears throat> which is the mango tree or Musufi, they, they, they actually, all of this builds a soundscape that actually is in alignment with the place. The place, um, th there's a kind of collusion basically between place and language, as you might expect over thousands of years. But to be able to wield that idiom without being didactic or without confusing people, is I think really important as, as, as a writer. So effectively, again, you kind of, ultimately the, the task for me anyway, is to absorb a place mm. in a kind of immersion program. And then, so I don't have to think about, I just communicate it back via language, but also by, by this kind of frequency that you pick up if you spend long, if you're interested enough and you spend long enough in a certain place. Um, and I think this is, we see this across, you know, across literature, across, across fiction, but to a greater or lesser extent. It depends upon the kind of monomania of the writer involved, perhaps, <laughs> or whether, whether that happens. So I think it, I think it is um, very, very, um, I think it's very tethered to language, Duncan, yeah. Um, and I think language has this same mystique, you know, that, that place has. It is the same thing, it's the same charge. A question from uh, uh, Maureen Nicoin in the uh, chat. In translating the language of the land, does the relationship between the aural and the visual become a zone of translation? Um, yeah, I think, I think if I understand that correctly, um, yes. I, the only thing one has to be careful of is a kind of projection in the sort of exoticizing sense. You know, for for example, a, a word like casuarina, which is a type of tree, it's a ferny type of tree. It sounds like casuarina sounds like what it is. It sounds ferny and a bit kind of ethereal. It 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 so in that sense, there is an alignment between the thing itself, once you know it, once you know what it looks like, and the sound of the thing. Um and and I think that writers are preternaturally alert. It's almost as if you're in a field of signs and symbols that have been pre-ordered or pre-ordained and it's your job to find the pattern um, and the pattern which will allow certain things to happen. So I think, yes, it is, but one has to be very careful not as an out, a so-called outsider to any landscape, which I would consider myself even an outsider to the landscape that generated me, although I know it very, very well. Nonetheless, there is no insiderdom here as, as humans. Um, we're not here for long enough. So you have to learn it, like you have to rote learn it. Um, but 
but not give it back in that kind of rote learning, um, somewhat expansionist, neo-colonial fashion. So yeah, you have to be true to the, the, again, the charge, I go back to that word, the kind of energy of the environment and choose the right word, but in a way which is not didactic or, or, or showing off you know, how much you know about a place or how much you acculturated yourself to a place. It's, it's, a, it's a fine line. Yeah, it's a very fine line as a writer. <laughs> You make it sound as if, at least for a phase, this is quite. This is a very passive process that you're letting, you're letting the environment, the, the landscape, influence you, work on you, speak to you, before you, uh, in a sense, speak back or or, or translate or uh, speak to it. Um, is that? Do you think? Is it kind of in phases like that, or is it going on simultaneously in both directions? Um, yeah, I, do, I don't know. I don't think there is any mutuality, basically. That's what I've determined. I think, you know, the, 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 not, the more than human world, I mean, we're just ephemeral, basically. We're passing through, not, not, as a, not in, in aggregate, unfortunately, as a species, but, but as individuals, yeah. Um, I think the, the best way to know a place is to get really, really bored to spend so much time that you're absolutely screamingly bored. And you just, you think, what am I doing here? Why am I, why am I here? Nothing happens here. My real life is elsewhere. You know, I have work to do. Um, and then when you reach a point of kind of desperate boredom, and uh, I'm, I, I don't think I'm ever really bored. It's a word, it's not the right word, but it's just, you just have to be somewhere for a long time, not doing much. And then you start to hear, then you start to hear exactly what happens at exactly what time. The first bulbul that strikes up at 5.55 a.m. Every, there is a clockwork to the world. And um, you have to actually be there for quite some time to be able to, 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 to hear it and then to decode it, yeah. There's a question from Joanna Dodson. Do you feel that all land has the ability to speak with us or are there certain places on the planet that have greater capacity for translation as acupuncture points on the human body, for instance, may transmit in a way that other parts of the body do not? And if so, what might the qualities of the fabric of places that are more communicative in this way be? I mean, yes, I do. I do think that. And with, you know, I mean, there's a risk of me sounding like I'm some sort of shaman here, but, but effectively, no, absolutely. I really do. But I think that certain places speak to different people. It's almost as if you're on an, there's a vast grid, you know, there is a vast energetic grid and some people are in alignment with certain places and they, they like acupuncture, it's a very good uh, metaphor actually trigger they they trigger things but that can be the only explanation and i don't know if places have to have extraordinary natural beauty like what tommy does or that or some sort of mm, almost magnetic mystique magnetic as in geo geological mystique i don't really know but i'm absolutely convinced that there is a sort of field of communication that we have really quite um poor access to as human beings. We just haven't really developed that way, unless you're a Buddhist or a phenomenologist or a shaman, you know, unless you're practicing in that realm. Um, and I, I think this is, this is laterally, I realized I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm 52 now, it's taken me a while to <laughs> catch on to this, but I think this is part of my, my, my mission, my self-appointed mission as, as a writer is, is to try to, again, when those points of affinity are reached to try to understand what could that be about and what is the history of the land and what is the geology and what is its kind of destiny um, and, and to try to create a human story which somehow elicits that. And I, I think those with some, somehow elicits those eternal issues. And I think I have done that. I've actually successfully managed to do that in a few of my books, yeah. Yeah, so basically I agree, but I can't explain why <laughs> and how it works. Yeah. Dean, a, a number of questions have, have, have started coming through, but we, we have time, I think, for only, only one final uh, question, which is this. Um, hello, Jean, uh, says an anonymous attendee. Thank you for your fascinating talk and the beautiful reading. 
you talk about the Antarctic being beyond description and words. At the moment, I'm thinking a lot about the significance of the polar region in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Is it a kind of reverse to what you're expressing about the Antarctic? In Mary's novel, the pole is there to evoke a sense of inhumanity that could not otherwise be expressed in words, emotions that cannot be translated into words. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a there's a lot of scholarly literature which explores the Antarctic as the kind of the, the, the place that is beyond everything, beyond language, beyond the earth, beyond it's a kind of hoax effectively in this kind of scholarly um, investigation or idiom. So it is it is the kind of counterpoint. It functions as the counterpoint, this, the Hades, the netherworld to everything that, that, that is human and everything in fact that a writer might want to explore. The Antarctic is pressed into service as, as being its kind of, its, its negation. So that's actually quite common. I think of course in, in Frankenstein, she hadn't, you couldn't go to the Antarctic at the time. Very few people, Captain Cook has, had sailed near the Antarctic, but that was it. Um, so it was a notional space for a long time. It has actually remained a notional space until roughly about a hundred years ago. Um, so I think it functions metaphorically in a lot of our imaginary, our human social species imaginary, because it was always beyond us until very recently. Um, so that's what I think about the Antarctic, but in terms of it being beyond words and beyond, what I guess I really mean is you can represent it, yes, but, but, but you come very, you come really hard up against like, what is the point? why am I representing this place that has to, you actually have to see it with your own eyes and then you're changed forever. It really is that kind of mystical conversion. And if I try to represent that and nail it down on the page, all I do is siphon out that, that kind of monumental primitive power from the place. Um, yeah, so that's the conundrum of the Antarctic. You can represent it, but it doesn't, it doesn't really help, you know. Um, yeah, that's what I think. So Duncan, I know you've got to finish, so I'll stop there. That's uh, absolutely fine. Uh, Jean, thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing your, uh, your, the images, uh, sharing your, uh, your, your draft manuscript um, and sharing your, your thoughts now in the discussion. Uh, it's been a wonderful way to bring to a close the, the if, if you like, the, 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 the scripted, the official part of the of proceedings at our conference do, do